Welcome to our devotional today. We are in the midst of a chapter in Revelation uh, that is wrapped up in much conflict. In our last study, we witnessed a war between the nation of Israel, symbolized by a pregnant woman, and Satan, symbolized by a great red dragon. So as we begin into our text today, we will notice that these verses continue the image of this conflict. In fact, verse 7 is quite a shock to the system. So I want to read verses 7, 8, and 9. And then we'll get into this. It says here in Revelation 12, verse 7, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. When we read of war in heaven, it kind of takes us back. We do not think of heaven as being a place where wars are fought. If the Bible announced a war on earth, we would not have been shocked at all. Our world has a long history of bloody warfare. Um, yet, when we read of warfare in heaven, we are taken back. This war will settle a conflict that has been raging since before there was a world. As we discovered in the early verses of this chapter, Lucifer, who seems to have been the chief among the angels, sinned against God, and he led one-third of the angels of heaven away from God in this rebellion. And he and they were removed from the presence of God. Lucifer became Satan, and he has done everything in his power to disrupt the eternal plan of God to redeem his people and his ruined creation. Since that time, as we will discover, Satan has limited access to heaven. This chapter tells us about that final battle in the ages uh, old war. In this battle, Satan, that great dragon, is forever cast out of heaven. And while there are some details here that may seem confusing to us, these verses are a blessing to the children of God. They tell us about a day when Satan will finally and eternally be cast out of heaven. So let's look at these verses and examine a few more of the participants of the tribulation period as we look at this idea of the devil being cast out. Notice, first of all, the revealing of the dragon. There are several passages in Scripture that talk about the devil and his origin and his activities. We're not going to take time to go back into those today, but I encourage you to jot down Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 20, and Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19, that tell us about the origin of the devil. But then also we see verses like 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 that talk about his activity. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, <coughs> excuse me, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Friends, Revelation chapter 12 seems to reveal the devil far more clearly than any other passage in the Word of God. So let's take a little bit more time to look at him today. First of all, look at his names in verse 9. It says, That great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world, and he was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. A quick look at the names given to this creature reveals more about him then he wants people to know. First of all, he's called a dragon. That's a win winged mythical creature that resembles a serpent with four legs. Dragons are often associated with fierceness, brutality, violence, and destruction. Superstitious people in the Dark Ages lived in fear of fire-breathing dragons. Friends, this image is fitting for Satan. He is a violent character bent on the total destruction of God and his creation. He is responsible for countless deaths and wars. But he's also described here as the old serpent. Friends, this immediately brings back to my mind the first appearance of Satan in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. In that passage, Satan appears to Eve in the form of a serpent and entices her to commit sin. The image of a serpent is an image of something that is evil, contemptible, detestable, deceitful, underhanded, and sly. Oh, friends, what a perfect description of the devil. He spends his time attempting to deceive everyone that he encounters. But he's also described here as the devil. That word very simply means uh, that he is a diabolical creature. 
It pictures him as a creature who stands before God, accusing the saints of God. And friends, that's just what he does. You can see that in Job chapter 1 and verse and chapter 2. When we fail, he accuses us before the throne of God. He slanders our name and he slanders our Savior as well. And then the Bible also says that he is Satan. That word literally means adversary. It means one who stands opposed. And friends, that is what the devil is all about. He opposes everything that has to do with God. He opposes everything that God is trying to do. He opposes the people of God, the house of God, the word of God, and the plan of God. And he stands in open opposition to everything that is decent, that is holy, and that is right. He is an adversary. And it also, in verses 9 and 10, tells us about his nature. This passage not only reveals Satan through his names, but also through his nature. This passage reveals two of the most common activities of the devil. Let's take a moment to look at them today. First of all, he is revealed by his earthly descriptions. We are told in verse 9 that he deceiveth the whole world. That word deceiveth literally means to seduce, to lead astray, to lead out of the right way. That is Satan's mission. When he appeared before the Lord in Job 1.7 and Job 2.2, 2, he was asked about his activities and he replies that he had come from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Friends, he was on the prowl for souls to deceive. That's what Peter says about him in 1 Peter 5 and in verse 7. The word seeking in that verse literally means that he is craving, that there is a reason to plot. Satan is always plotting someone's fall. He craves the souls of men, and he reasons out ways to turn people away from God and away from Christ. And let me say this, friends, he is good at what he does. He can come into our midst and not even be recognized. Listen to Second Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 13 and 14. It says this. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He is a deceiver, and he has always been. When he came to Eve in Eden, he is called subtle. Friends, that mean that word means that he is tricky, that he is sly. He deceived Eve, and he has been deceiving people ever since, and he will continue to weave, weave his web of lies and half-truths until he is cast into the lake of fire. But not only does, he re, does it reveal his earthly deceptions, but he's also revealed by some heavenly declarations in this verse. In verse 10, Satan is described by the host of heaven as the accuser of the brethren that he has cast down, which accused them before our God night and day. That word accuser literally means to make an accusation. It speaks of a plaintiff who brings up another person's charge. Friends, that is Satan's business. It seems from act, from Job 1 and 2 that Satan still has some limited access to the throne of God. And when he appears there, he does so to condemn the saints of God. He did this to Job and he did it to Joshua. You can see that in Zechariah 3 1. He stands before God and he points out sins and our failures. Friends, <laughs> to be honest, he doesn't have to lie about us because we've given him more than enough failure in singing our lives that he has a ready supply of accusations to make. Yet when he opens his mouth and declares his case, the saints of God have a man on their side. We have a de defense attorney. We have a lawyer in heaven. First John 2 1 says uh, about that lawyer, it says this. It says, My little children, these things have I written unto you that ye sing not. And if any man sing, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That advocate is one who pleads the case of another before a judge. Oh, friends, he pleads our case. Uh, Hebrews 7.25 says that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. In Romans chapter 8 and in verse 34, it says, 
Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Oh, friends, we can rejoice today that he intercedes for us. Jesus Christ, our advocate, stands up to declare us just and justified. He pleads our case by showing the nail prints in his hands and his feet. He pleads the blood, the shed that he shed on the cross as the perfect eternal payment for all our sins. The father cries, case dismissed because of our defense attorney. But he is the accuser of the brethren. Let me ask this today as we close. Are you doing the devil's business? It's sad today that there are many Christians who are accusers of the brethren. And friends, when we do that, we are not working for God. We are working for the enemy. To tomorrow, we'll go back and we'll look at these verses once again as we look at the removal of the dragon. Have a great day.